Hi, this is Ben Quellen. Today I'm talking about the four types of languages. What are they? Hey, hit that subscribe button. It really helps the channel. Thank you so much. There are only four types of languages. You have gluing languages, agglutinative, analytic languages, which are isolators. You have fusional languages, which are like between the two on a spectrum. And you have polysynthetic languages, shapeshifters. Now today I'm talking about analytic languages. If you are thinking of learning a language or you're interested in languages and you don't know which language quite to learn, well, knowing how languages work really helps. If you want to learn a difficult language or if you want to learn a language that's not difficult but one that's far away from your current language, it helps to understand which languages are closer to your language in terms of how they work, even if they're unrelated to each other. There are only four types. So English is an analytic language. It isolates things. It's basically a point and speak language like Swedish or Chinese. Where are analytic languages spoken? They're all over the place. So you have English. This is an analytic language. And it probably gets this from the Scandinavian languages. Danish, Norwegian, and Swedish are all analytic languages. Not German or Dutch, though, ironically enough. Afrikaans, however, which is very close to Dutch, is an analytic language. But you have languages far away which are analytic as well. Chinese is analytic. A lot of Southeast Asian languages are analytic as well. Vietnamese, Hmong, Lao, Thai, Burmese, Khmer, going into the Pacific, Hawaiian, and Maori. These languages are analytic. They put things in boxes. They separate words rather than bringing them together. I mentioned Afrikaans. You have another African language, and that's Yoruba, which is a lot in Nigeria and that area. It's a big African language. This is analytic as well. Oddly enough, there's not really any in the Americas of the Native Americans. They're not an analytic type peoples, except for one small family, the Mixtec family in southern Mexico. This is an analytic language. By the numbers of languages themselves rather than speakers, analytic don't really punch that high. But the numbers of speakers, because they have Chinese and English, oh, they are significant. These languages have one word means one thing, and you build the sentence in a structure to convey meaning. And if you want to change the meaning, you replace a different word. They're, they're, they're set apart from each other. They're not fused or glued. There's no shape determining what those words mean other than one word means one thing. So to give you an idea of how analytical languages work, check this sentence out. The dog by the ditch gave the puppy by the house a bone. Break this down. A lot of sentences don't have a word for the. A lot of Slavic languages like Russian or Croatian would not generally use that type of thing. And then languages like Welsh don't have a word for a uh or an. Nearby. A dog. You don't need to say a dog. Besides. So that's going to confuse a lot of people coming into analytical languages. There's a lot of these small words that they just wouldn't understand. And then you have near and by in the same sentence. And as you'll see in a minute with Arabic, that doesn't really translate in a lot of languages as being a different word. So analytical languages have a lot of small words for things to do with space and directional location. For a lot of people learning English, this is really difficult. So you can tell Arabic speakers right away in English because they get the long or scientific and literary words in English really well. But what confuses them are the small prepositions or connector words in English. Because in Arabic, you have fi, and this means in, by, at. It can mean near or nearby or up to, depending on which version of Arabic you're speaking. But English just 
has like six different words for that one word in Arabic that can mean all of those different things. And this is really confusing because you don't know which one of these connector words goes into what format. So connecting words in English is the thing that's really difficult for people when they're learning it, not the actual big words. One thing that separates analytic languages like this apart as well is they have verbs for very specific things. Like English and Chinese, who which are both analytic or isolated languages, they have a verb to have. Look at this map of how different languages convey the verb to have in terms of like, I have a house. English and Chinese and the analytic languages are more prone to actually having a verb for the word to have. But that's not really how it works in most languages. So like Celtic languages, like I speak Welsh, my Geni, you know, it literally is, it is with me that I have a house. So let's look at Scots Gaelic, for example. Habata Agam. And that literally means there is a boat with me or to me. And that's how Celtic languages convey it, as opposed to having a verb to, to have a boat. That AM at the end in Scots Gaelic there, that's a conjugation. So you're fusing kind of with and me into one meaning. So it's not just throwing it into a box. And I'm showing you this because I want you to see how analytic languages are different from other languages. They're the exception, not the other way around. Chinese and English are the ones that are different. To take the Japanese language, this has something that's really unique. They have a particle, this word, and it's no. It just sounds like the word no. And so in English, you have apostrophe S. Mike's car. You wouldn't do that with Japanese. You'd say, Mike, no car. You establish a relationship between the words, the two nouns. Because this word, no, it doesn't mean ownership. It means relationship. It's more of a building a bond rather than a mastership over. It's more, it's, a, it's more of a sharing way, I think. It's cool. So let me show you how it works. Neko means cat and mimi ears neko no mimi cat's ears but it goes a step further you don't have to have it in terms of ownership like the cat has ears you can build bonds between other types of words without the ownership being there in that sense so you have you can say a gold ring in english how does it work in japanese kin no yibuva so no goes between ring and gold it is expressing that the ring has goldness to it. So again, it's a relationship particle. And English builds things in terms of ownership over things. The Celtic languages, like many other languages, build it in location to where is it around the person? The house. The house is with me. Not I have a house. That apostrophe S to denote ownership, again, it's, it's throwing something into a box, building a, a space to isolate just that meaning. So I have a house. Most languages don't speak this way. You don't have a car or a house. In many languages, it is with you. The small words are very different in these analytic languages. So like in Chinese, the word for and and the word for with are the same word. Honey, honey, they're the same. This is true in Navajo as well, which is a bit different from other Native American languages, which I'll get to later on. Most of them are polysynthetic shapeshifters. In English, you'd say, the boy gives the ball to the woman. And every word is a specific thing. I'll, I'll show you how this changes in other languages when I get to fusional languages. But let's look at Vietnamese, which is just like English or Chinese in that regard, that it doesn't really change. Let me show you what I mean. So in Vietnamese, you have, she's sitting on the bike. Koi ai in gai trains adap. And each word literally means each word. It even follows the same word order as you would expect in English. 
There's nothing that changes there whatsoever. There's no difference. If you put a period after each word, like this, it's no different. There's no radical form in that. English works the same way. She is sitting on a bike. You could break that apart and put she is sitting on a bus or he is sitting on a bike and everything is the same shape. He was sitting on a bike. She will sit on a bike. There is that change with the sit because of the tense, but there's not that much of a change. It does show that English is not entirely analytic. It is on a spectrum. It's mostly analytic. It has some almost residual conjugations and verbs like Dutch. It's very close to Dutch in that way, but it is an analytic language where Dutch is not. Afrikaans is very close to English. It's closer to Dutch, but it's been simplified. And a lot of languages, when they simplify, especially like when pigeons are created, they are analytic because they're point and speak languages. That's not to say Afrikaans is any more primitive than any other language. It's a very elaborate language, but it works a lot of the same way that English does, which is a point and speak language. Let me show you a sentence in Afrikaans. And also, I want to show you that, to show you that the word order can change. Because like Dutch, you can put the verb or action word at the end of the sentence, which doesn't quite fit in English. Je kan dit doen. And word for word, that's you can it do. The structure of the position where it is is different. But each word represents a specific idea. You don't have two words in that one word, meaning different elements of the grammar in the sentence. Once you know the structure of Afrikaans, or to a large extent Dutch, you just put them in the slots. Now Dutch is not an analytic language. It has more conjugations. It's fusional, but it is on a spectrum towards analytic. And that bridge where Dutch kind of meets analytic is where English takes off into being more analytic. Languages like Hawaiian or Vietnamese are much, much more analytic in most cases than English. So what you have here is you have a series of boxes and you just throw a word into each one to create a sentence. Now, if you don't know any other languages, it might seem strange to you that that's not actually how most languages work. This is the exception, and it's pure chance that English and Chinese have both become very dominant. Most languages do not work just putting words in slots like this. And I want to show you what I mean by that. So that brings us to fusional languages. Fusional languages are up next, so stay tuned. Hey, Thank you very much for watching.